question. Hey, Rama, hey, Rama, 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 hey, hey. All right, we are on Facebook now. And we're getting ready to start. Oops. All right, we are ready to start. Lights, camera, action. Whoops. Here we go. Okay, so this is our evening Bhagavad Gita discussion, question and answers, and study or whatever. We're on the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the modes of nature. Okay. First, we will chant Jai Radha Madhava like we normally do. Jai Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunya Bihari Gopi Janap Malaba Kiri Bharad Hagati Gopi Jana Malaba Giri Bharadha Hodi Vishodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Vishodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Ran Umadhova Kunya Bihari Jaya Ran Umadhova Kunya Bihari Gopi Janavalapa Giri Bharadhahudi Gopi Janavalabha Giri Bharata De Yasoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yasoda Nandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Ran Homad Huva Kunya Bihari Jaya Ran Homad Huva Kunya Bihari Jaya Om Vishnupad Paramahansa Paravidakacharya also tell us it to Shi Shimad. His divine grace, Savaya Chalana, Ravakta Goswami, Srila Prabhupada Kijai, Iskan Founder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada Kijai, Anantakoti Vaishnav Vrindi Kijai, Namacharya, Srila Hira Staku Kijai, Param Se Gaho, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nichananda Shidway to Garadha, Shiva Siddhi Gaur, Vakta Vrindi Kijai, Shri Shri Radhakrishna, Gopi, Gopi Nath, Shaima Kunda, Radakunda, Giri Govardhan Kijai, Vrindavanam Kijai, Majuram Kijai, Jagadabhasami Kijai, Yamanamai Kijai, Jumadi Galasi Devi Kijai, Samaveda Bhakta, Vrindi Kijai, Gaur, Premananda, Hari Hari Gaur. All glorious the assembled devotees, all glorious the assembled devotees, all glorious the assembled devotees. All glorious to Shi, Guru, and Gauranga Shila. Prabhupada Kijai, Gaur Premananda, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya, 
Utle, Shimati Bhakti Vedanta, Swamati, Namani, Namaste, Saraswati Devi, Gauravati Pacharani, Nibhashesha, Shunya Bhadi, Paschacha, Tejitarani. So, Om Magana Timivanda Shah, Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshoda Miditam Yeda Tosmai Shri Gave Namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, his divine grace. A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with a torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, actually, before we get on to the Gita, I just want to get some water. That's all right. Right. Okay, so we are continuing. It's good to see everybody tonight. We've got a nice crew, 34 people. We're continuing with our study of the Bhagavad Gita, and we're on the chapter, The Modes of Material Nature. And as we have mentioned many times before, actually we'll go to the text right now, that these modes of material nature are all pervasive within this material world. In the spiritual world, the modes are actually, obviously, absent. <laughs> uh, but in this material world, everybody who's not a devotee of the Lord is controlled by the modes. And those who are not pure devotees of the Lord are influenced by the modes. There's a difference. Influence means you don't have to succumb to the control. Control means, that's it, you are controlled. You don't have a choice. So, basically, we should function on the intelligence platform. As Krishna says, um, earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego are the material elements. And the highest of these material elements is the, the not the mobile phone, which I have to turn off right now. Uh, is the intelligence, of course right now it's material intelligence, material intelligence means we are getting direction from super soul according to our desires. But spiritual intelligence means that we learn what is the right thing to do according to Guru, Shastra, and Sadhu. And regardless of what our impulses are telling us or is it influencing us that we do the right thing in each and every case? It's a very interesting statement. Do the right thing. We should always be thinking about what is the right thing? The right thing is what pleases Krishna. Very easy to understand. So we can ask ourselves at every moment, does this activity or does this thought or does this relationship or whatever, does it actually please Krishna or does it not please Krishna? So remember that statement. <clears throat> Always do the right thing. The right thing. Okay. Hopefully, I'm not going to start sneezing again. Achoo! Okay, excuse me for a second. Achoo! It's allergy season, that's why I'm sneezing, so you'll have to bear with it. So let's continue with our... <coughs> It'll stop after a second, or two, or three. But, uh, it's part of the material miseries. <coughs> Right? Maybe one more time, or maybe not another time. <coughs> okay. Urvam gachanti sattvasta majeta shanti tajasaha tiganya guha britista 
Ogachanti tamasaha. So Urdwam upwards. Kachanti, go. Oh, Sattva sta. Those situated in the mode of goodness, Maja, in the middle. Tish Anti, dwell, Trajasaha, those situated in the mode of passion. Jaganya, of abominable guna, quality. Riti sta, whose occupation, other down. Gachanti, go. Tamasaha, persons in the mode of ignorance. So, translation. Uh, those situated in the mode of goodness gradually go upward to the higher planets. Those in the mode of passion live in the earthly planets, and those in the abominable mode of ignorance go down to the hellish worlds. So was any in the chat. Camera is facing the ceiling. Thank you for telling me. <coughs> that was because of sneezing. The camera started to freak out. <laughs> If I do anything like dramatic, like sneezing the camera, can't understand where I am. <clears throat> anyway, so, uh, okay. In this verse, the results of actions in the three modes of nature are more explicitly set forth. There is an upper planetary system consisting of the heavenly planets where everyone is highly elevated according to the degree of development of the mode of goodness. The living entity can be transferred to various planets in this system. The highest planet is Satchaloka or Brahmaloka, where the prime person of this universe, Lord Brahma, resides. We have seen already that we can hardly calculate the wondrous condition of life in Brahmaloka, but the highest condition of life, the mode of goodness, can bring us to this. So you may think, that's a good idea, that I want to go to the heavenly planets. Well, there's a problem with that good idea. The problem with the good idea is, several problems, is that your stay there is temporary. Because as we mentioned, the modes are in continual flux. And even if you're in the mode of goodness, you're accruing a lot of good karma. Remember, there is good karma, there is bad karma, and there is no karma. And that is karma, a karma, the karma. That was our beginning study, actually, in the Bhagavad Gita. We started to talk about that. <laughs> so karma, <clears throat> excuse me, karma means good karma in that particular context, which gets you good results. And one of the good results is you go to the heavenly planets. Now, the good karma, when it runs out, guess what? Shine punye macha lokam vishanti. You came back, you come back down to this planet, the middle planet again. So it's temporary. It's described that when your good karma runs out and you're in the heavenly planet, your garland starts to fade and all of a sudden you're gone. But when you go back to Godhead, your good Krishna conscious activities stay with you forever. You never lose them. Never lose any good you do for Krishna or the results of any good you do for Krishna or any spiritual good. But you lose everything else. Your good you do for other people. Your good you do for the material nature. Anything else you do good in this world, or anyone else other than Krishna and Krishna's pure devotees or Krishna's devotees, that's temporary. So you may think that's very nice. So the mode of passion is mixed. It is in the middle between the modes of goodness and ignorance. A person is not always pure, but even if he should be purely in the mode of passion, in other words, Prabhupada's saying that when we say that someone is a mode of passion, we usually don't mean he's purely in the mode of passion. That means there's a mixture and passion is predominant or the dominant mode. He will simply remain on this earth as a king or rich man. Sounds good. But because there are mixtures, one can always go down. Sounds bad. People on this earth in the mode of passion or ignorance cannot forcibly approach the higher planets by machine. In the mode of passion, there's also the chance of becoming mad in the next life. Of course, madness comes from the mode of ignorance, okay? Uh, actually, there's a statement by Lord Rishabhade. Let me try to remember that statement. Nunam pramata kurte vikarmi karma yarindriya apritya apranauti nisaro manye asanas atman of yam asano viklesha di asha deha. Nunam pramata kurute vikarma 
uh, those who actually, uh, let's see, Yunum Pramata, people are crazy if they consider sense gratification to be very dear to themselves. Yadindriya Priti Aprinoti. And so the word used as Pramata means really crazy. <laughs> the word Mata means bewildered. Like you have from that word you have Madan Mohan or Madan who is Cupid. And uh, Pramata means really crazy. <laughs> so those who are attached in the mode of passion, Nunam Pramata Kurte Vikarva, because they actually are crazy, they eventually commit the karmic activities and then they go down and become mad. Okay. The lowest quality of the mode of ignorance is described here as abominable. The result of a developing ignorance is very, very risky. It is the lowest quality in material nature. Beneath the human level, there are 8 million species of life, birds, beasts, reptiles, trees, etc. And according to the development of the mode of ignorance, people are brought down to these abominable conditions. The word tamasaha is very significant here. Tamasaha indicates those who stay continuously in the mode of ignorance without rising to a higher mode. Their future is very dark. You know, that's people take intoxication, drunk, like that, and people sleep all the time, or people procrastinate. There is an opportunity for men in the mode of ignorance and passion to be elevated to the mode of goodness, and that system is called what? Krishna consciousness. But one who does not take advantage of this opportunity will certainly continue in the lower modes. So how does someone get elevated in Krishna consciousness from the lower modes to the higher modes or to Krishna consciousness? By hearing the holy names. Because the holy names purify the heart. By purification of the heart, then you rise above the mode of ignorance and passion and goodness, and then you come to the stage of uh, the Shuddha Sarva, which is transcendental goodness. So that's the solution. So for those in the modes of ignorance and passion, they can't really understand philosophy. And so you may ask, why do we give people books? Because even if they don't understand the book in the beginning, if they touch the book, if they read one word in the book, if they give a devote devote a donation, or if they put the book in a very respectable place in their house, then they will make spiritual advancement and eventually come to Krishna consciousness. Even, I heard this amazing story that Prabhupada told. One devotee approached Prabhupada, was talking to Prabhupada, and this devotee was one of our big book distributors, and the devotee said to Prabhupada, we're distributing books in the airport. And uh, sometimes these people who work in the airport, they're really demoniac. And they said they take the book and they may even tear it up and throw it in the garbage. What's going to happen with them? And Prabhupada said, Krishna is so merciful that just by touching the book, they're making spiritual advancement. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So you see that even... Uh, that's like Namabhas chanting. <laughs> even if one's joking, making jokes about the devotees, or even if one is uh, chastising the devotees, or even if one is saying the holy names accidentally or meaning something else, there's still some spiritual benefit. So Krishna is so potent in that way. In this, especially in this book distribution, Krishna manifests himself as the book, which is a deity. Anyway, so that's really what helps people. It's the sankar time that helps people. I mean, you can tell people they're not the body until whatever, uh, until the end of time. And they're not going to understand they're not the body. But as soon as they come in contact with a devotee, as soon as they hear the holy names from a devotee, as soon as they take a book, as soon as they reciprocate with a the devotee, then they can rise above the modes of nature. And what's the example we give about, let's give the example about the holy names. This Haridas Thakur we talked about a few days ago. And the prostitute. This prostitute was in the mode of ignorance. Whoops, someone else is sending me a chat again. Oh, all glories. <laughs> okay. So this prostitute was in the mode of ignorance. That's what it means to be a prostitute. 
ignorance. Sorry about that. So, uh, and this prostitute had as her desire to make Haridas Thakur fall down. And this prostitute was trying to make money from it, from this Ramchandra Khan. Yet she came in touch with this devotee, Haridas Thakur, and came in touch and heard the holy names and imitated his chanting and offered obeisances to the Tulsi tree at the same time. And as a result, after three days, she felt so much remorse that she took initiation from Haridas Thakur and became a great pure devotee to the Lord and went back to home, back to Godhead. It's just a little association. Of course, we have this wonderful verse in the Chaitanya uh, Charitamrita. What is that? Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastra Koi. Uh, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoi. Now this uh, statement, Lava Matra, indicates like an eleventh of a second that if you associate with the great devotee hmm, for even an eleventh of a second, you achieve all perfection, ultimately. So when you touch Prabhupada's books or associate with Prabhupada in that way, you're going to get all perfection. Somehow or other, you're going to get all perfection just by that little bit of association. Just like we were talking about association with the modes of nature, how they can drag one's consciousness down. So the association with the pure devotee can just pull you up to the spiritual world. The pure devotee is present not simply in the physical manifestation, because we, those who have taken the disciple course know the difference between Bani and Bapu. The physical manifestation or the body of this pure devotee is known as a Bapu. But the pure devotee is, even more importantly, situated in his Vani or his instructions. That means his service, uh, the words of the pure devotee. And so Prabhupada is personally present in his books. So all these devotees, they're getting in the association of Prabhupada. Amazing. All these people. By the mercy of the devotees, Prabhupada's sincere followers. Okay, so let's continue. Text 19. Nanyam gunebya kartaram yada drastanu pasyati gunebyascha param beti madbhavam sodigatshati anano ayam other gunebya then the qualities kartaram performer yada when drastas asir anupasyati see properly gunebya to the modes of nature cha and param transcendental beti knows Madhvavam, to my spiritual nature, sahahi adigachati is promoted. When one properly sees that in all activities, no other performer is at work that these modes of nature, and he knows the Supreme Lord, who is transcendental to all these modes, he attains my spiritual nature. So in other words, when we observe things in this world, I mean, for example, right now, we're in the midst of, I guess, a political situation in America. And we're not going to get into the details. So if you see with eyes of Shastra, Shastra Chakshush, you'll see that it's just the modes of nature that are manipulating people to act in a certain way. And our business is to take people out of these modes of nature. It's not to get into mundane politics, just to try to to favor one mode over another mode, take positions in mundane politics. No, our position is to bring people to Krishna consciousness, awaken people. That's the point. Just like if people are sleeping and it's time for them to wake up, uh, we don't worry whether in their deep sleep, dreamless sleep, or dreaming sleep, we wake them up. <laughs> It's not that, I'll give you an example. That's actually something I just thought of. Uh, something I just thought of. Uh, I wish people wouldn't send me messages in the middle of class. Anyway, it happens to be Father's Day in Australia, New Zealand, Fiji. So, uh, just like a, there's different stages in sleep. There's deep sleep where you're unconscious completely, not even dreaming or anything like that. There's dreaming sleep, light sleep. So when you're trying to when you're trying to wake someone up, you don't think, let me just dream, wake them up from deep sleep to dreaming sleep. You want to wake them up completely. 
So if we engage in trying to just shift people from one mode of nature to another and materially, it's not going to be effective. That's why Prabhupada was not so favorable to just preaching vegetarianism. It's interesting. You know, sometimes we think, well, just preach vegetarianism. Of course, we can use it to attract people. I understand that. But at the same time, we have to be very, very careful not to be taking mundane stands in Monday on mundane issues. Of course, you take mundane stands on mundane issues. We have to bring people to the highest platform. And as we see, what Prabhupada would continually do. So we don't get into, you know, mundane propaganda. And we don't really get into so much supporting mundane politicians. Unless something's favorable to spreading the Krishna consciousness movement, you know. If a politician is part of his uh, political platform, says, I'm going to make sure that everyone has the Bhagavad Gita, certainly we would support him. So, this is important. When one properly sees that in all activities, no other, that's an absolute statement, no other performer is at work than these modes of nature. Wow. And you know the Supreme Lord, who is transcendental to these modes, uh, in other words, you have to know the Lord is transcendental mode devotional service. When we talk about the Supreme Lord, we're talking about the pure devotees, the devotional service, paraphernalia, the deities. You know, all those things connected to Krishna. They're all transcendental. So when you know that and you take shelter of that, and Bhagavad Gita mentions that, when one takes shelter uh, of the internal potency Bhakti Yoga and Sivate Sagunan Samati Chaitam, Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate, he attains the spiritual nature. Same thing. Mantiyo Bhyavichare, now Bhakti Yoga and Sivate Sagunan Samati Chaitam, Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. Purport. One can transcend all the activities and the modes of material nature simply by understanding them properly, by learning from the proper souls. The real spiritual master is Krishna. And he is imparting this spiritual knowledge to Arjuna. That doesn't mean our spiritual master is not a real spiritual master. It means, dharmam tu sakshat bhagavad pranitam, that transcendental knowledge comes down from the original spiritual master, Krishna. And the present spiritual master, he is simply, uh, not exactly repeating like a parrot the words of Krishna, but repeating the essence of the Vedic knowledge that has come down from Krishna. <clears throat> now, this is a very interesting discussion that we're having today. Actually, I was having today in regard to some issues on the GBC. Uh, there is something called Siddhanta. Siddhanta basically means perfect conclusion. And these things are incontrovertible. In other words, these things don't change. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> of a Siddhantic point. You're not the body. You're a spirit soul. You're undergoing incarnation. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God. And all the incarnations are portions of plenary portions of Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God. That's Siddhanta. Uh, and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his various books, uh, writes about, he comes up with ten items of Siddhanta. Of course, there are more called the Dasamula. Dasamula means the... Uh, Ten roots. Because mula means root. So let's not just talk about those ten right now, but just let's talk about what Siddhanta is. Uh, and we will contrast that with applicational details. So many times people think that details of application are Siddhanta. Because as Prabhupada comments in his books, one spiritual master may give some details of application, and another spiritual master may give even conflicting details of application, but these are not Siddhanta. They are not incontrovertible, absolute knowledge. These are time, place, and manner injunctions, or instructions, or guidance. So we have to understand what is Siddhanta. It's not Siddhanta that we dress in a particular way or we wear our tilak in a particular way. 
That's not Siddhanta. That's a practice that we do, but it's not Siddhanta. It's not absolute. As you see, it changes from one sampradaya to another, and, you know, these different types of dress change. So we have to be able to distinguish the two. So what we're interested in is Siddhanta. And the details, yes, we can accept them for the sake of unity, but we understand there's a difference between them and absolute truth, which never changes. So sometimes, the reason I'm mentioning that is that sometimes you'll find two spiritualists with differences of opinion about details, and they will term their details to be Siddhanta. But they're not. They're really not. I mean, actually, I'll explain. The context in which we're discussing this right now uh, on the GBC is about the women's guru issue, which you've all heard about before, and I've spoken about many times before. So those who are opposed to having ladies initiate, they're saying this is Siddhanta. But it's nowhere mentioned in the Shastras, and basically there's no evidence that that's any sort of uh, absolute principle. There's no evidence that it's absolute principle. There is evidence that certain people didn't want it, or certain teachers in the past didn't want it. But there's evidence that other teachers in the past did want it. So you don't want to make principles that are relative or details that are relative according to time, place, and circumstance. Uh, don't want to uh, state them as being absolute, because they're not. Very, very important point. Very, very important point. And the, the problem is that when one becomes a spiritualist, and especially you're given perfect knowledge uh, by Srila Prabhupada, we have been given perfect knowledge by Srila Prabhupada, then there's the tendency to think because I have perfect knowledge, therefore whatever comes out of my mouth, since I have perfect knowledge, must be perfect. That does not compute. It is not a fact that everything comes out of your mouth because you have perfect knowledge must be perfect. But there is that tendency. It's a, it's a material tendency, too. When one gets too much knowledge, one thinks of themselves as an authority in a particular subject matter. But we should just think that we are learning this Krishna consciousness and not think that, you know, we're authorities and everything I say because I'm chanting Hare Krishna must be absolutely perfect and Siddhanta. So it requires a great deal of discrimination uh, to understand the difference between something that's a detail and something that's a principle. Now, we're using the word principle uh, in the same co uh, context or meaning the same thing as the word Siddhanta. Principle means unchangeable things. Like that. Okay. All right. Got that off my chest. Similarly, because that's something we're working on right now. It's hard for people to grasp that point. Even older devotees, it's hard for them to grasp that point. See, because usually when we want to win an argument, a philosophical argument, we'll just term something to be Siddhanta. Similarly, it is from those who are fully in Krishna consciousness that one has to learn the science of activities in terms of the modes of nature. Otherwise, one's life will be misdirected by the instruction of a bona fide spiritual master, a living entity, can know of his spiritual position, his material body, his senses, how he is entrapped, and how he is under the spell of the material modes of nature. Sometimes, the spiritual master, he knows all these things, but he can't really tell you everything else you faint. <laughs> Probably would say, he tells you everything true. But if he tells you how much in Maya you are, I mean, it's just like, oh my God. <laughs> and you get very discouraged. He is helpless being in the grip of, not the spiritual master, but the conditioned soul. He's helpless being in the grip of these modes. But when he can see his real position, then he can attain to the transcendental platform having the scope for spiritual life. Actually, the living entity is not the performer of different activities. He is forced to act because he is situated in a particular type of body conducted by some particular mode of nature. Unless one has the help of a spiritual authority, he cannot understand 
in what position he is actually situated. Hmm. If the association of a bona fide spiritual master, he can see his real position, and by such an understanding, he can become fixed in full Krishna consciousness. A man in Krishna consciousness is not controlled by the spell of the material modes of nature. We mentioned that. But if he's not fully in Krishna consciousness, or fully in Krishna conscious, then he may be influenced by that. You know, he may feel the pulling, or the tugging of the modes of nature. But he just has to say no, or as we mentioned in the beginning of this class, do the right thing. It has already been stated in the seventh chapter that one who has surrendered to Krishna is relieved from the activities of material nature. For one who is able to see things as they are, the influence of the material nature gradually ceases. There's the influence of material nature, which means he doesn't have to give into it, but there's some influence, this is exactly what we said before. So it requires developing one's intelligence, making one's intelligence very strong. What is the intelligence in this particular context? It means knowing what is the right thing and following it, doing the right thing. So how do you make the intelligence very strong? Is the question. Uh, one is good association, another answer to that question is reading Prabhupada's books. Because then you'll have, know how to do the right thing. Just read. You read Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita is so important. I mean, many people think they're so advanced they don't have to read Bhagavad Gita. But Bhagavad Gita, every time you read it, teaches you something practical. This knowledge is not meant for an armchair speculator, as Prabhupada said. That means someone who just sits around and talks philosophy. This knowledge is meant for application. Why is there so much information about the modes of nature? Because we're meant to apply it. Not just because it's interesting. I do find it interesting. But I also apply it in my own life. I apply it in observing others. I apply it in instructing others. Okay, let's read this next text. Gunane tan aticha trin dehi deha samud bhavan. Janmam ritu jira dukar vulmukto mritam ashnute. Gunan, qualities, etan, all these. Aticha, transcending, trin three. Dehi, the embodied, deha, the body. Samud Bhavan produce of a uh, produced of Janma of birth, Ritu death, Jala on old age to Kahai, the distresses, be muktaha, being freed from Amritam nectar ashnate he enjoys. <coughs> Excuse me. When the embodied being is able to transcend these three modes associated with the material body, he can become free from birth, <coughs> death, old age, and their distress and can enjoy nectar even in his life. In other words, when he identifies himself as whoever he is in the spiritual world, that's how you transcend these three modes of material nature and engage fully in devotional service. As we quoted before, Mamchi Yogi Abhichareda, Bhakti Yoga Sevate, Sanguta Sagunan Samati Chaitan Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate. So that's what it means. Uh, to transcend the three modes and be absorbed in Krishna consciousness, absorbed in your spiritual identity, absorbed that you're a servant of Krishna, absorbed, that's your intelligence, I'm a servant of Krishna, that's your sense of identity, I'm a servant of Krishna, I'm a servant of Krishna, I'm a servant of Krishna. Just repeat that again and again, because that's what the Hare Krishna mantra means. Please, Krishna, let me serve you, Hare Krishna. Please, O oh, energy of the Lord, engage me in Krishna's service. And that way you're free from birth, death, old age, and then distresses, and you can enjoy nectar. Nectar means, how do you enjoy nectar? Not simply by drinking some nectar. You drink nectar with the ears. You enjoy nectar by hearing Krishna Gita, by bringing other people to Krishna consciousness, uh, by uh, seeing the beautiful form of the deities, by doing some service for Krishna. There's many ways that you can enjoy nectar. K. Valananda. Bhaja bhaja bhai, Chaitanya Natai. So, what does that mean? Just worship Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. And then, Kevalananda, you can, understand, you can appreciate unlimited or only bliss or only happiness. 
according to this verse. As Luchandas Thakur. How can one stay in the transcendental position, even in this body, and full Krishna consciousness is explained in this verse? The Sanskrit word dehi means embodied. It means people who have a body, a material body. Although one is within this material body, by his advancement in spiritual knowledge, he can be freed from the influence of the modes of nature. He can enjoy the happiness of spiritual life even in this body because after leaving this body, he is certainly going to the spiritual sky. But even in this body, he can enjoy spiritual happiness. That's called Jivan Mukta. He's liberated even within this lifetime. In other words, devotional service in Krishna consciousness is the sign of liberation from material entanglement. And this will be explained in the 18th chapter. When one is freed from the influence of the modes of material nature, he enters into devotional service. Okay, text 21. Arjuna vacha karalinga shrin gunane tana tito bhavati parvo kim achara katam gachai tyams trin gunana tivartate. Arjuna vacha Arjuna said kai by which linga high symptoms trin three gunan qualities etan all these aditaha having transcended bhavati is prabhu oh my lord kim what acharaha behavior. Katam hal cha also etan these trin three gunan qualities adivartate transcends. So Arjuna is inquiring. Arjuna inquired, my, "Oh my dear Lord, by which symptoms is one known who is transcendental to these three modes? What is his behavior, and how does he transcend the modes of nature?" Wow, this is the essential question. How can you identify someone who is transcendental to these modes? You know, how does he act? What other symptoms does he show? And how did he get there? And how can I get there? These are questions, important questions. Because Krishna here is showing the problems with the modes of nature and the benefit of transcending the modes. And Arjuna is saying, yo, wow, how do I do it? And how can I see within myself and within others uh, the symptoms of someone who has actually done that? In this verse, Arjuna's questions are very appropriate. He wants to know the symptoms of a person who has already transcended the material modes. He first inquires of the symptoms of such a transcendental person. How can one understand that he has already transcended the influence of the modes of material nature? Second question asks how he lives and what his activities are. Are they regulated or non-regulated? This is a very good question. Actually, I just want to mention that sometimes people think that when you transcend the modes of nature, you have to forget about regulation. Well, good news for you. When you transcend the modes of nature and you're on the spiritual platform, you act more regulated than even before because you're aware of the principle of what? Yadyata charity shrestas tatat evetaro janaha. That people will follow your example. Like as great men act, other people also follow. Or as leaders of society act, others will follow. Just like probably gave the example with George Harrison. When George Harrison acted and chanted Hare Krishna, other people followed. So one who is really on the spiritual platform has to be very careful as to what example he or she sets. Because people follow, even if you do something inadvertently, people will follow. Uh, some innocent thing. For example, you know, one time Prabhupada uh, drank 7-Up and then shortly thereafter the devotees ordered a whole truckload of 7-Up delivered to the New York temple. So the principle is if a great devotee gives people an inch, they take a mile. So a great devotee has to be very careful not to give people reason uh, to do some nonsense. Even for a great devotee, there's nothing wrong. Great devotee can do anything. Then Arjuna inquires by the means, of the means by which he can attain the transcendental nature. That is very important. Unless one knows the direct means by which one can be situated always transcendentally, there's no possibility of showing the symptoms. So all these questions put by Arjuna are very important, and the Lord answers them. Very important questions, and they'll be answered in this next group of texts. 22 to 25. Shri Bhagavanavacha, 
Prakasham cha pravritin cha mohome vachaban the bad of HD sam pravitani Nabritani kongshati Udasana vada si no ganavio nav chalyate Guna vartan tahitevam Yovatishati nengate Samaduka sukaswa sta Sama lo stash makanchanaha Tuya priya priyo diras tuya nindat mustam sutihi Amana pamana yos tulyas tu yo mitra ripakshi oho Sarva ramba paritiagi unatita sa uchate Sri Bhagavan Vacha, the Supreme Personality of God, had said Prakasham illumination cha uh, pravati and attachment cha and moham illusion eva cha also Pandava son of Pandava and the she does not hate some pravritani although developed na nivitani not stopping development kangshati desires udasinavat as if neutral as thought asinaha situated gunai by the qualities yaha one who not never dichalyate is agitated Gunaha, the qualities, vartante, are acting, iti evam, knowing thus, yaha, one who, avatishtati, remains, na, never, ingate, flicker, flickers, sama, equal, dukkha, in distress, sukha, in happiness, wasta, being situated in himself, sama, equally, losta, a lump of earth, ashma, stone, kanchanaha, gold, tulya, equally disposed, priya, to the deer, a priyaha, and the undesirable, dira, steady, Tulya, equal, ninda, in defamation, atma, sounds to he, and praise of himself, mana, in honor, apamana, yoho, and dishonor, tulya, equal, tulya, equal, mitra, friends, ari, and enemies, pakshe, yoho, to the parties, sarva, val, aramba, endeavors, parityagi, renouncer, guna, atita, ha, transcendental to the material modes of nature, sahi, uchate, is said to be. The Supreme Personality of God had said, O son of Pandu, he who does not hate illumination, attachment, and delusion when they are present, or long for them when they disappear, who is unwavering and undisturbed through all these reactions of the material qualities, remaining neutral and transcendental, knowing that the modes alone are active, who is situated in the self and regards alike happiness and distress, who looks upon a lump of earth, a stone, and a piece of gold with equal eye, who is equal toward the desirable and undesirable, who is steady, situated equally well in praise and blame, honor and dishonor, who treats alike both friend and enemy, and who has renounced all material activities, such a person is said to have transcended the modes of nature. So I've got to explain a little bit about this. So even though the body that they're in may be manifesting, or their material mind may be manifesting illumination, you know, mode of goodness, attachment to something, or bewilderment, they do the right thing. They don't act on them. They just understand it's not me. They see it's just the mind. That means they're unwavering, undisturbed, and neutral. This is a very, for me, it's a very easy thing to understand. You're standing apart, looking. You're introspective. You're looking at all these reactions that will occur in your body or in the bodies of others or in material nature in general. Let's say, I mean, it's a good lesson for all of them, including me. Like, like if you look at the news and you see sometimes there's a little illumination, a lot of attachment, and tons of delusion. <laughs> in other words, you don't get into it. You just say, well, this is the modes of nature. And if it's happening within your body, and within your mind, you just remain neutral and transcendental. Regardless of what's happening, happening in, dis in distress, etc., like that. Uh, friends and enemies. Of course, you, in the same time, you do make friendship with the devotees, but you don't accept people as friends or enemies because they please your senses or displease you in any way. And that's, these are the symptoms of someone who's transcended. <coughs> Arjuna submitted three different questions and the Lord answers them one after the other. In these verses, Krishna first indicates that a person transcendently situated has no envy and does not hanker for anything. When a living entity stays in this material world, embodied by the material body, it is to be understood that he is under the control of one of the three modes of material nature. 
when he was actually out of the body, then he is out of the clutches of the material modes of nature. But as long as he is not out of the material body, he should be neutral. In other words, neutral to whatever is happening in your body and mind. Talking about the subtle body as well as the gross body. Subtle body is mind, intelligence, false ego. And the gross body is uh, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. He should engage himself in the devotional service of the Lord so that his identity with the material body will be automatically forgotten. When one is, in, is conscious of the material body, he acts only for sense gratification, but when one transfers the consciousness to Krishna, sense gratification automatically stops. One does not need this material body, and he does not need to accept the dictations of the material body. You don't need that. You can be free of that. You just say no to your material body and your material mind. Here we're talking about the subtle body, too. Uh-oh. Someone keeps asking me to go to chat here. Oh, just a thank you note. Uh, so the qualities of the material body will act, but the spirit soul the self is aloof from such activities. It ain't me. It's not me. Just remember that. The mind is telling you to hate someone. That's not me. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul, his enemy as well. It's not me. How does he become aloof? He does not desire to enjoy the body, nor does he desire to get out of it. He tolerates. Thus, transcendentally situated, the devotee becomes automatically free. And in other words, by identifying himself as his true nature and not following the dictates positively or negatively of the material body. The next question concerns the dealings of a transcendentally situated person. We may have to end now. Okay. Uh, this is actually an important purport. I don't want to go quickly over it. Let us save that for tomorrow, if that's all right. Okay, so now we can uh, take some questions. We have 43 people watching. This is our Sunday feast, virtual eating, virtual hearing, virtual sangha program. So let me just unmute everybody so you can all ask questions. Because people like this portion of the class. Questions and answers. Perfect questions, perfect answers. So, who has a question? Gurudev, I have a Gurudev, question. I have a question. Yes, Mr. Gopal. So, this verse, so this verse this incredibly important verse, has a long checklist of symptoms for someone who's yes. situated in transcendence. So, what if we observe someone who checks off some of the boxes, but not others? It's making progress. Not an all or nothing thing. He said, I got, I got two out of the three. Am I hopeless? <laughs> no, you're making progress. Actually, that's really good. We observe someone like that, then psh, that person's a great saint. What does Krishna say? My devotee is to be considered saintly in spite of the most abominable action because he's rightly situated. So he's on the right path. And so because he's on the right path, you know, hey, He's, a, he's wonderful, isn't it? It's like we have three classes of devotees, right? We have the uh, Kranishtadikari, Majamadikari, and Uttamadikari. So Majamadikari, we're supposed to act like Majamadikaris. That means the middle class. We're supposed to make friends with the devotees, be merciful uh, to those who are innocent, avoid those who are inimical, and worship the Supreme Personality of God in. So as second-class devotees, we're supposed to see, even if one chants Hare Krishna once, we offer obeisances in the mind. What to speak of someone who's developing these qualities? Wow, that's pretty cool. To use a 1960s expression, pretty cool. Actually, actually, nowadays, if you say that's pretty bad, it means it's good. If you say, if you say you're really bad, Prabhu, Yeah, it actually is true. That's the that's the way that people say that. Like if I say Gopal, it's really bad, and Gopal says that's the best thing you ever said about me, Guru Maharaj. My question will be. Okay, so next question. Now you can put your hand down, Gopal. You remember how to put your hand down, now, don't you? No. Uh, I'll, put, I'll put your hand down for you. 
Okay, uh, Richard Gage, you have a question. Yes, good day. Uh, this basically the checklist which, uh, which uh, Gopal Prabhu just talked about. It is basically more for self-assessment uh, or instead of judging others, right? I mean, that's right. It's mostly for self. Well, it's for self-assessment. And let me see. Someone else does not have themselves on mute, and let me just check to see who that is. Give me a second. That must be you, Rishikesh. Anyway, so whatever it is, I'll ignore all the sound in the back. It's for self-assessment and also to look for advanced devotees that we can associate with, but not as a means to criticize others. If we use it as a means to criticize others, that's Vaishnava Aparada. Yeah, self-assessment and to look for advanced devotees to see the symptoms of advanced devotees. Well, that's myself I'm in the background. Okay, any any other questions? Hi, Krishna. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. So, sorry. Can I ask? Okay. So, when you are talking about, and we hear it often about when we're in ignorance if we dream, but what if we're dreaming about like service? I didn't, I, or I didn't say we're in ignorance if we dream. I said it's, I was using dreaming, dreaming sleep or deep sleep or light sleep as an illustration of waking people, you know, what it means to wake people up as a comparison to Krishna consciousness. If someone is dreaming about Krishna, that's wonderful. That's a good dream. And a nightmare means to dream about Maya. One time, one time I had a, a dream, it was about six months ago, I dreamt that I was, uh, I, would, I dreamt that I was working in, uh, oh my God, I shouldn't mention this. I dreamt that I was working as a cabinet member in uh, Donald Trump's presidency. And I was in the White House. <laughs> so, oh my God, what a horrible dream. I woke up praying to Krishna save me. Okay, so it's true, I did dream that one time. It's unbelievable. I don't know where it came from. It must have been a reaction to my past sinful activities. So, all right, who else, who else has a question? And at the end, we want to let Aditya Narayan Prabhu make his announcements because it's Sunday. Anybody else have a question? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Hare Krishna. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj, when you're talking about Siddhanta, I'm thinking, like now I was thinking about the Tulsi Pranam Mantras when we say Brinda, Tulsi Devi, Aprakeshwar Sita. Some people say Vishnu Bhakti and some people say Krishna Bhakti. So how does, does the Siddhanta apply to prayers? Because I remember you telling us that we should not change the weddings of the prayers. Well, that's that's not Siddhanta. That has nothing to do with Siddhanta. That's a detail. Because one Acharya may say Vishnu Bhakti. Like if you go to, uh, yeah, it's like Prabhupada said Vishnu Bhakti, and another Acharya may say Krishna Bhakti. And neither of them are violations of Siddhanta. That's a detail. Nothing to do, that has nothing to do with Siddhanta, actually. But it has everything to do with repeating what Prabhupada said. For example, Prabhupada, in writing and in speaking, gave us the mantra, Vishnu Bhakti Pravei Devi. But it's not wrong to say Krishna Bhakti. It's not against Siddhanta. It's, not, it's just a detail. But because my, let's say my life is I'm taking things from Prabhupada, therefore, according to my bhakti, you know, I just do things, at least I chant the mantras the way Prabhupada gave them to us, that's all. It doesn't mean someone else is wrong. Now, if someone makes up a mantra that is rasa bas, that is against Siddhanta. A rasa bas mantra would be like that group that chants Bhajra uh, Nitta Ego Radisham Japa Hari Krishna Hari Ram. That's a that's a mantra that's bogus because it has not, uh, rasa bas in it. Uh, there's an improper mixture of uh, rasas in there. You know, if I make up my own mantra. You know, Jai, you know, anyway, I'm, I think there's some funny mantra to make up. 
Jai, Gopal, you know, Gopal Nishinga. <laughs> I mean, Jaya Gopal Nishinga, Jaya Gopal. That's a made up mantra. You got a Rasa Bas in there. And that's not, you know, it's not bona fide. But, but to say Krishna Bhakti or Vishnu Bhakti, you're both bona fide. It's both bona fide to say it that way. But, you know, my connection was with Prabhupada. So that's why I say it the way Prabhupada said it. It's not with a member of the Gordian Mouth who said it a different way. That's all. It's as simple as that. That's not to criticize. It's not to criticize someone who does it a different way. It's just you know I don't criticize someone who does it a different way, but it's my connection with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada gave me the mantra that way, and it's in writing. It's not just my concoction. It, it's in a letter, several letters that Prabhupada wrote to his followers. So that's but that has to do with my connection with Prabhupada, which is which is basically a personal thing, and it's not Siddhanta. Yeah. You understand? So there's a lot of things that I'll do that we'll all do in Krishna consciousness that have to do with Prabhupada's instructions, but they're not necessarily Siddhanta in an absolute sense that those same instructions apply for everybody in all circumstances. I mean, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Bhakura said that everybody, anybody who doesn't chant 64 rounds a day is in a fallen condition. Mm -hmm. Because Prabhupada said that means we're all in fallen condition. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he allowed his disciples who were preaching to only chant 16 rounds a day. So, you know, there's different injunctions at different times, which are not necessarily Siddhanta. Uh, Lord Chaitanya would not uh, basically talk or, or eat prasadam in anyone's house who wasn't chanting like two lakhs of rounds a day. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not Siddhanta. It's his personal approach. It's a detail. And if Lord Chaitanya applied that to us, we'd be in trouble. So there's, we really have to distinguish what is Siddhanta because people will use that word Siddhanta to mm -hmm. defeat others in argument and say that you're, you're, you're not preaching the right Siddhanta. I mean, even they take it to that whole discussion that people have is where the soul came from. Did we come from the Brahma Jyoti? Did we come from the Tadashta? Did we come from the spiritual world? And people have different opinions. They'll hit each other over the head with that word Siddhanta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you hear that all the time. You're preaching up a Siddhanta. Mm -hmm. up a Siddhanta. Mm -hmm. You know, a Siddhanta. So th it's a very heavy statement. But Siddhanta are those, are, those are the principles that don't change. And a lot of stuff is variable. Like even what instruments we use in the temple to, uh, for kirtan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, or instruments we use on Harinam for Kirtan. They're not Siddhanta. That's, you know, those are details that are given to us by Acharya, but that's not Siddhanta. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, anyway, it's mm -hmm. not Siddhanta. Like, like you, know, you know, it's not that everything Prabhupada said is Siddhanta. Like Prabhupada said, potatoes are the king of all vegetables. But when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was present, there weren't potatoes in, in India. In certain parts of India, they refuse to eat potatoes because they're, you know, they're, they're grown in the ground like an orissa or carrots. Mm. You know, so you got some Vaishnavas say that you're breaking the Siddhanta because you're eating carrots. Mm. But that's not Siddhanta. Those are just details. Details, you know, they have nothing to do with the Siddhanta. They're details and your spiritual master may tell you to eat carrots or not to eat carrots. Probably like carrots. But then you'll go some places in India where they'll tell you that you're going to hell because you're eating carrots. Mm -hmm. and I guess I guess Bugs Bunny would be in hell if that was the case. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like carrots. But, uh, that would be a problem, poor guy. So uh, you know, so these are, these are just details, and people just take all these details and they turn them into absolute principles. Uh, all right, so we better let Aditya Narayan speak right now because this is our Sunday feast program mm -hmm. and everybody's expecting some nectar from Aditya Narayan. Hey. Hey. Are you there? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you so much for a nice class, Maharaj. So many wonderful points. 
Yes, man. Thank so, you. Uh, uh, so one point. Uh, there's just a couple of points, man. I'd like to mention. One is uh, uh, last Tuesday we had the uh, Badr Punima celebration, and uh, you know we were um, like we had been reaching out to people all over uh, North America, actually, like in our local area, and also uh, all over North America. In, uh, uh, inspiring people to get Shriman Bhagavatam sets. So I just wanted to announce that our entire team here, we had a goal of like 50 Shriman Bhagavatam sets and uh, we distributed over 72 Shriman Bhagavatam sets. So that's our, uh, so that's our uh, offering to Shila Prabhupada and offering to you, Maharaj. And uh, we still have more orders coming in. So it's going to go over 75, hopefully. So uh, that's our offering. So thank you so much, Maharaj, for your inspiration and blessings. And also you're making such wonderful points about book distribution today that anyone who even comes in contact, like even touches Prabhupada's books, he gets so much uh, spiritual benefits. So thank, thank you for that. Man. And uh, the other announcement is, uh, uh, is an opportunity to offer service to Tulsi Maharani. And uh, in our temple, we are actually uh, uh, going to soon get a new a greenhouse for Tulsi Devi, like today morning already it was like 58 degrees, so it's starting to, you know, the weather is starting to change. So very soon we'll need uh, a nice new greenhouse for Tulsi Devi. So we have a fund, uh, fundraising and uh, we have one devotee is also willing to match any donations. So if you contribute anything from your side, it will be matched by this anonymous devotee. This is the link here on the chat. And if anyone would is inspired to serve Tulsi Maharani by uh, helping us. Whoops. You just said uh, you went off. Uh-oh. Uh, Ditch and Ryan Prabhu, can, I'm still online, I suppose. I, I can't hear him anymore. Everybody can still hear me. Yes, Maharaj, we can hear you. Okay, so, uh, yeah, he was just talking about the Tulsi Devi. That, uh, anyway, he just gave the link for the uh, Tulsi Devi thing. I think we have it almost completely funded already, so it's, it's not an urgent thing. And uh, let's see if he comes back online. Ask on mute. He's muted now. Maybe somebody should text him on the phone and tell him what happened. Well, I think he knows because he sees us all talking. Uh, let me just see if I can. He needs to unmute. Hare so Krishna Maharaj. Can you? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Sorry, Maharaj. I, I don't know why I got dropped off the call. But uh, yeah. basically, I posted the link on the chat box. So if anyone is inspired to serve Tulsi Maharani by helping us get a new... Uh, greenhouse for her and we need that very soon because the weather is changing please do cons consider contributing anything from your side that will help us uh, get a new nice greenhouse for service of Sri Tulsi Maharani mm. so uh, very nice okay and then, and then anyone who wants to help with the temple then you just what do they do about that yes Mara, so we can post the uh, paypal link here and if you'd like to contribute anything towards the service of Sri Sri Radha Golokananda and uh, Sri Goloka, New Goloka Dham, uh, you can actually contribute on this PayPal link right here, which I'm posting on the chat. And, um, and if you have any questions about the services here or uh, any particular uh, project you're inspired to serve or contribute, please contact Mother Leela Shakti or myself. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, you can sponsor the deity worship, or everybody's welcome to take darshan of the deities and come in any time to take darshan. And in addition, Mangalarti is broadcast live both on uh, Mayapur TV every morning, as well as on my Facebook page, which is BK Goswami Das. And if you go to that, uh, my BK Goswami Das, my Facebook page. You'll see we have a special camera on the deities. It zooms in and out. And also you'll see the dancing that's going on in the same time in the temple. So you'll be able to participate in Bangalarti. You'll be able to participate uh, later on in Tulsi Puja. And uh, 
the Tulsi Puja, Guru Puja for Srila Prabhupada every morning, and the, the greeting of the deities. And the cl class will generally be, if I'm giving class, the class is on my Facebook page, and otherwise the class will be on the Facebook, will be on uh, Mayapur TV every day. So all of our programs are online. So you're welcome to join us at any time online and see the beautiful forms of Shishi Radhagalokananda and uh, participate in Krishna Kata. Okay, so I, I, I know Sumuk has his hand up, but I think we'll just wait till tomorrow. Sumuk, we'll wait till tomorrow. Yeah. We, we can wait till tomorrow to hear that. And uh, Sumuk is from Fiji. So we want, want to wish everybody a happy Sunday or Monday, which it happens to be Monday morning in Fiji, Australia, and New Zealand. And we look forward to seeing everybody at same time tomorrow, same exact time tomorrow. This is a standard. Every day, it's the same time. And we're working on the Bhagavad Gita. When we finish the Bhagavad Gita, we'll probably do a, an intensive study of the nectar of devotion like we're doing on the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, if, you attend these courses, if you attend these courses, uh, I mean, this class, you'll actually understand the Bhagavad Gita very well. So far, we're up to... 97 lessons. So 97 lessons. All these lessons are also there on my YouTube channel. We, they're recorded. You can watch them later on. Uh, YouTube channel is Beer Krishna Goswami. Beer Krishna Goswami. I think that's the YouTube channel. And you can see any of them on the YouTube channel. So, anyway, so it's a good way to learn the Bhagavad Gita. We're really going through verse by verse, word by word. The whole Bhagavad Gita, this is probably more intense than the Bhakti Shastri courses on these books. But it, it's going to take a lot longer. But you'll learn them. If you hear nicely, you'll learn this philosophy. Okay, all glorious to his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai. Jai. Jai.